Hi, welcome to Infinite Leaders Live, the podcast that shares real life lessons from real life people. We're incredibly fortunate to speak to so many inspirational people from around the world, and we're delighted that you decided to join us today to listen, learn, and share. As usual, I'm joined by my pal, Alan Dunstan in the desert. How are you, Alan? Yeah, great. Thanks, Lewis. And we're proud again to wear our Tsunami products, and Tsunami is the number one choice for eco sportswear. And I'm really excited about today's guest. She will certainly, certainly talk about the things you don't get taught at university or on any courses. As ever, we love uh, the feedback that we get from our listeners. So please do get in touch, whether you want to get in touch with us via Twitter, Instagram, YouTube or the infinitelearners.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please press subscribe and please review when you get the chance. Be better educators, be better humans. Let's get stuck in, Alan. All right, get your pens and paper ready, guys. There's going to be some absolute gems of wisdom coming out to the show today. Helen Olds has 17 years, was, years working in leadership positions in international schools in Asia and the Middle East, and is currently the principal of the British International School, Riyadh. She is passionate about providing high-quality learning and co-curricular experiences for students with a strong emphasis on student well-being. Helen recognises the power of collaboration as a key tool to improving educational experiences for students. Her diverse experience, passion for learning, energy and drive are key elements of her leadership. So Helen, welcome to the show and from the family farm in Cornwall to Asia to the Middle East, tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, thank you, Alan and Liz Lewis, for that wonderful welcome. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be on the show today, and thank you, so, thank you so much. Um, I, I enjoy listening weekly, so it's a very interesting experience to be on the other side. So, yes, from Cornwall to Saudi Arabia, it's it's been quite a journey. Um, I've sort of been reflecting on that over sort of the last few years because you know a lot of the children that we teach in international schools are what we call third culture children. You know, their parents may be from, you know, countries which they've not actually never lived in um, and, you know, they've moved around the world. And I see myself very much as a, a third culture adult, but having come from a very, very stable um, uh, and background in Cornwall. And, you know, my family have been in Cornwall for, for generations and, you know, I, I was born and brought up there and you know my parents never pushed me um they were always wanted us just to be happy and I know my parents spoke to me a lot about you know yeah if you're gonna go and work in Woolworths and you're happy that's fine Helen you know and they just wanted us just to be um to, to enjoy life and obviously you know your family are very proud with where you end up and what you end up doing but you know I was very fortunate to have you know living in a place where you know the family home is still the family home you know we've not we've not moved um, my parents are in the place where I was born and brought up so it's really interesting that I've now kind of moved into this lifestyle where I've moved around and I think I'm now on my um, seventh country that I've that I've lived in um, but you know, things sort of inspire you and somehow this ability to work across cultures and with people from a whole array of different countries and the challenges and the fun that that brings. It's just something that sort of drew me in and wherever children are, they deserve that right for an amazing education. Um, and so, yeah, so that's sort of where it, where it all started. Um, I had, um, I went to university in Wales, um, cont continuing sort of the, the rural theme. And then from there moved into, into Devon, um, working for seven years at a um, comprehensive school there. It was actually the only one in a Dartmoor National Park. And I was having an amazing time. The kids were wonderful. It was, uh, you know, all the challenges you sometimes get in a comprehensive school in the UK. And I thought, you know, I need to go traveling. Um, I, I, I'd like to go and see a bit more of the world. I could end up being here for the rest of my life, which would be no bad thing. But I just felt there was something else out there and took the opportunity to, to move to Brunei. Um, and then over the next sort of 15 years, moved across Indonesia, Malaysia and for six years in the Philippines, and then most recently um, moved to, to Saudi Arabia. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. 
It has, Helen. That's a hell of a journey. Tell us how that supportive environment growing up has, has supported you remotely, if you like. You know, you, you could have quite easily stayed there for a long time, as you said, whether that was in Devon or whether that was in Cornwall itself before, before you moved over to teach. How did that supportive environment that your family created give you the confidence to, to go and do what you've been doing and to travel where you have and to take the, the chances that you have? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I suppose it's, it comes down to belonging, doesn't it? And it having that, for me, it's that sense of belonging. And I'll go back and the whole family's still there. Um, and it, there's always a sense of that's always where I'll go back to. That's where I'm from. I know what I'm about. Um, but there was no pressure and I think that was one of the great things I do feel for children these days that you know often there's a lot of pressure you've got to get these amazing exam results you've got to go and do this you've got to do that internship you've got to do you know so many clubs and activities and things and these poor children have their sort of lives micromanaged day in day out um sort of you know every part of their day is plotted out and we didn't have that you know growing up you know it was it was a lovely time we'd go out and just play on the farm and then you know you kind of check in every now and again but you know your parents didn't always know exactly where you were or or what you were doing um and you know it's that 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 sense that you know you just felt really loved and cared for where you were in this you know strong sense of community and I think that for me is something that's really important and I've always tried to bring into whatever schools that I've been working in is that for those children, if they do move around, it's really important that while they're with you, they feel like you are their family because they don't have that family and necessarily um, extended, you become their extended family um, for them. So yeah, so it's, it's kind of given me a lot to reflect on, but I, you know, I'm internally grateful to my family for the start that they gave in life, you know, no pressure, um, but gave you the wings to fly. And um, what, what an amazing upbringing that was. Yeah, we, we love that expression, Helen. It's roots and wings, and uh, it was it was on a previous podcast where Jake Comfrey talks about that a lot. The importance of having those roots at home, and then the parents giving you the wings to fly. So, just just tell us a bit more about what inspired you to be a teacher, and then how did that transpire to them working overseas? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, people ask me that and I, I, I'm not sure that I can tell you the answer. I just always knew that I was going to be a teacher. Um, and I remember at school when we were sort of doing GCSEs and my peers were planning, well, what if I don't get the grades, I should apply for this college and, you know, and, and you know, the local technical college and bits and bobs. And I hadn't even considered it. And I, it definitely wasn't a level of arrogance. It was just I kind of always knew what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, I continued through with my A-levels and I was knew that I wanted to, you know, go and get a degree rather than necessarily go straight into teacher training. But it was just something that was always there as, as a calling. And in the end, I didn't really ever consider any other um, career path. Um, and even now, I, I wouldn't think of doing anything else. You know, I feel that it was my calling and I very much have always felt that it's a vocation for me. And, you know, I absolutely love love what I do. That's a nice feeling, isn't it? Loving what you do. Now, at the moment, obviously, you're head of school at the British International School of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Going from being a teacher to being a, a head of a secondary school, which I know you were in Manila, and then up to head of school, you know, that's very different to being a teacher, I imagine, isn't it? What, what started that sort of journey and, and what made that switch start to change from being a teacher to actually wanting to do a little bit more and move up that ladder and be in senior leadership and, and, and be part of that change culture? Again, I'd say it was never really planned. You know, I always wanted to go into education and I wanted to make a difference with everything that I did. And from the outset, um, I did my first NQT year um, at South Dartmoor Community College in Devon. Um, and then I had an opportunity to um, take on the um, Activities Week coordination job. And from there, it just sort of started. And it was more sort of accidental in many ways that somebody would say, well, have you thought about this, Helen? And, you know, my problem is that I never say no to people. 
and, and uh, I'm not sure whether that's a good or a bad thing. It's taken me on some quite exciting adventures. Depends um, what we ask, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, but, you know, you say yes, and then you go, how on earth am I going to pull that off? And I, I remember that first year going, I've got hundreds of children to place on activities and ensure they're off um, doing these things for, for, for this week. Um, but, you know, I, was, I think I was fortunate in having just these amazing mentors and people around me that just encouraged me to um, be able to develop and supported me. And I've never been afraid to just reach out to people when I don't know how to do something. Um, and say, can you give me a hand here? Um, what do you think about this to bounce ideas off? Um, and, you know, you learn a lot by people that are amazing around you. And I've learned, I've worked with some absolutely phenomenal leaders. You also learn a bit by people around you who go, how on earth did you get into that job? And, you know, actually, I think I could probably make a, maybe a uh, do it at least just as well or perhaps if not a little bit better um, and it's that it's that idea of always wanting to go in I suppose and and make a difference and and make things better and I've always had that philosophy I want to leave things in a better place than I found them um, and if I can go in every day and continue to try and improve and make things better then that's a great thing to be able to do yeah for sure it's, it's Tell me, Helen, a little bit about that learning process. You alluded there to the fact that sometimes you can learn from people's successes and their strengths, some people sometimes from their weaknesses and their shortcomings. How do you cognitively process that sort of journey? Is that something that you go home at night and make notes about? Is that something that you, you write about? Is that something that you, um, you diarise in some way? Is it something that happens sort of by osmosis? Tell me about that learning process of the things that, picked up from other people and how that sort of helped you along the way yeah good question I, I don't think that I really sort of go down and uh, go and write things and I, but I do what I do do in life is find times to have those moments I call them sort of my processing moments where I'll have a day where I'll go and do a walk or I'll go diving and it just allows me to kind of think things through and sort of mull over those things because um, you know what education's like, it's fast paced and frantic and you've got to create for yourself within there those moments which will allow you to be able to kind of think through all the things that you've learned and, and you've been doing. And it's often when I have my sort of my um, best ideas uh, and you, when you're reflecting on those things and yeah I mean there have been some great learning experiences in there and some things at the time you don't necessarily appreciate and sometimes it is that distance between something where you go actually at the time I couldn't ref understand why that was a great leadership tactic um, so I'll give you an example um, my first head uh, in Devon was an amazingly inspirational character um, but there were a lot there was you know, could be up to 20 newly qualified teachers in that school every year um, and you know having that youthful exuberance but yet that inexperience and yet somehow he just managed to draw the best out of us and was really ambitious for us um, and a lot of those people I started that journey with are now head teachers themselves um, and again it goes back to what you were saying Alan those roots and wings you know he really gave us we had good grounding in you know the nuts and bolts of our craft by the programs that were set up by that school but then we were given the wings to fly um, and he was incredibly ambitious for us all um, and very supportive of, of the work that we were doing as well so yeah um, so but it, it's sometimes you reflect on things in the moment and sometimes it, it takes a, a longer period of time. Um, I suppose to, to sort of go back to your question, Lewis, I don't spend hours and hours reflecting on sort of leadership styles so much because I think one of the things that I've learned on my journey is sometimes I have to be a different type of leader in different situations. And depending on where the gaps and the holes are in the organization, sometimes those are the bits that you need to bug. And so sometimes I need to be the detailed, orientated, um, you know, very focused and sort of almost sort of micromanaging something. And then sometimes you can step back and really be the, um, the person with the vision um, and empowering your teams around you. Um, and, I, and I've always felt instead of sort of 
learning lots about leadership and this is something one of my mentors uh, Simon Mann who I know you've, you've had on here um, said you know don't go and do a master's in leadership go and do one in learning because ultimately you're the lead learner in school and you learn so much about leadership um, from the learning process. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope that's answered your question. It was kind of a, a bit of a ramble there, I suppose. It has, and it's also given us a nice insight into that sort of way that you've rationalised maybe some of the reasons that you've made decisions as you've gone along, that different styles of management for different situations. And I do like the idea of being a lead learner in school, I think that's a really nice sort of analogy to, to look at a headship as leadership of schools in that way. Yeah, so it's been a, an interesting one for me because I'd always prided myself up to the point um, when I'd left the Philippines of still being able to be in the classroom and uh, be able to sort of demonstrate that day in, day out where you were, you had classes and you were teaching and you had, you know, exam results and, you know, you, people could see you being the lead learner on the ground. And I think it's something I've struggled a little bit with um, in my current role um, where I'm not in the classroom, yet I have the opportunity to teach in different ways, uh, leading professional development, working with teachers and teams but we have five campuses and so you know I've just be a terrible person to have in the classroom because you know we're in the middle of a global pandemic you know curveballs are coming in left right and center and you need to be on the ground because actually what the organization needs is you to be there dealing with that stuff um, and they don't need you um, in the classroom right now and I think coming to terms with that has been an interesting thing for me. Yeah, five campuses must be tough. You know, personally, I, I work across two and that's that, that's hard enough and I'm only at one of them for the moment. Can I just go back? I know Alan's got a question that he, he's dying to ask. Um, I'm sorry, Alan, I'm hogging it for the minute. Um, <laughs> just one last one on that, uh, Helen, is around um, that idea of, of being a lead learner and that idea of wanting to be in the classroom. How important is that sort of pedagogical knowledge and approach and understanding of learning within a school? And, and I ask that from a point of view of you do get in some schools with some individuals and, and some initiatives that are very well-being focused and pastoral, some that are very teaching and learning. And in some schools, they're very separate. In other schools, they're very much one and the same thing. Why is it the learning, the pedagogy side of things that makes um, being a teacher and, and being a leader within a school so important? I just think it's fundamental and you know you said in your introduction it's the things that you don't learn at teacher training college and we learned lots when I was doing my teacher training about you know little strategies you can use in the classroom but no one actually talked to us about what does the research show about how learners learn and for me that's something I'm really passionate about because you know there are so many things that you do and well, why do we do it and is it a good thing that we're doing it and is it what research shows is the best thing for, for learners and I feel as the sort of lead learner in the school uh, you know as the principal it's my job to ensure that I understand that and that's what's happening in our classrooms. And I don't think you can um, separate learning and well-being and all these, and you know, and enrichment and all those different parts of the curriculum off. Yes, you can look at them separately, but they all have to dovetail together. You know, if children are unhappy, they're not going to learn effectively. And so you, you can't, you can pull them apart to a certain extent, but they all have to come together. And I suppose one of the things I spend an awful lot of my time doing is reading and making sure that I keep up to date with what best practice is um, and encouraging that in, in school. You know, we have a, a, a book club. We're trying to, you know, cultivate that approach of what does the science say and how are we going to drive that through the work that we're doing um, in school. Um, and I love my times in the week where I go in and uh, I drop into lessons. At the moment, it's online. But, you know, when it's physically in lessons, you can go in, you can go and talk to children, you can see what's happening and to have those wonderful sort of coaching conversations with um, teachers to help them develop their practice um, as well. And it's just absolutely core to what we do and you know I hope that teacher training um, has evolved since when I when I went through it because you do sort of wonder whether there's a generation of teachers that have perhaps not had that grounding and you think 
but it's just fundamental to what we do. And I hope we haven't been letting down generations of learners by not knowing this stuff. Yeah, no, you, I completely agree, Helen. And the work that you've done in your schools is, is, is testament to, to how much you love learning. I just want to go back to the processing moments. I'm, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by that. And I love that phrase. And that's going to be one of my main takeaways from this. And I want you to try and link the processing moments because I know you love scuba diving. So how much, how much processing goes on while you're scuba diving? And then can we link that back to your year out with outdoor ed? And then how important do students need those, those moments, those processing moments as well, as well as teachers? Wow, that's a, that's quite a quite a broad question, but no, it's. I think you're right. Everyone does need those processing moments, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult. And in many ways, actually, in the physical activity of diving, I'm not processing. I'm. I like okay. to be in the moment. It's for me. It's kind of a, a mindfulness, and I just get engaged. And I can sometimes sit. You know, over the summer, I found an octopus. And I just sat there for 20 minutes watching this octopus and just being in that moment. But having so those moments Helen, to all my... Would you say, Helen, Sorry? that's more than just switch... Would you say that's more switching off your activity there? It's, so you, it's not a processing moment, but when you're switching off, the, the cognitive science there, it could mean that you actually are processing stuff that's going on, that you're just not thinking about it in that moment. I think it's about clearing your brain. So yeah. you're right, it is, it is switching off. But then when you sort of come back up again and you start thinking about things, that's yeah. the moment yeah. when your brain's just had that sort of brain break and that you yeah. come back. I sometimes have my best ideas in the gym because, you know, you'll, you'll be going at, you know, whether it's running or cycling or whatever it's doing, um, and you sort of clear the brain for a bit. And then it's almost like your brain almost recomputes and you go, right, yes, that was something I was thinking about earlier and you couldn't find your route through it. And then suddenly you have that moment where you go, yeah, I, I understand. Um, I, I understand my way through that. And I think that's something I'm really passionate about for kids. You know, you sometimes see, particularly in Asia, this sort of culture where kids come to school, they work really hard at school. And, you know, there are parents that want to put their children in tutoring until sort of late in the evening. And, and I very much see that as just, it, it just reduces outcomes for children because they need those brain breaks as well. And actually it helps them to um, process their learning and less is more sometimes. So yeah, I think that's really important. And that's why I've always been very passionate in schools that I've worked in, in that um, making sure that children have lots of opportunities to do sport and activities. Uh, outside of the, the curriculum. And, and to go back to your question about sort of my background in sort of outdoor education, and this is another occasion where Helen kind of didn't say no and ended up <laughs> doing something. You know, you're going, how did you end up here? But someone, and this is how often some of my things in my life have happened, not necessarily by um, great planning, but um, someone came into a lecture when I was in my second year at university and said, you could take a year out um, and go and do an internship in the US. And I thought, well, that sounds like quite an interesting idea. And then I thought, well, I suppose no harm done putting an application in and didn't really know what I was applying for. And then ended up in the US um, working for the University of Georgia, actually, in one of their outdoor education centers. And for me, that just immediately just made me realize teaching was what I wanted to go into and seeing those kids coming from inner city schools often from Atlanta um, you know to our center for maybe two three days at a time and watching it's almost like a switch being flipped and just watching those children uh, just grow the growth was amazing they would do things that they'd never believed they could do. And we had high ropes and low ropes and we take them out kayaking, we take them trekking and, you know, they were put out of their comfort zone and you could just see them visibly standing taller in, in that process. And, you know, we talk a lot these days about trying to develop 
children's um, resilience um, and making mistakes, being part of learning and having a go at things. And that was 100% that in action. And I think that has, for me, always shaped my approach to learning that, you know, yes, the classroom stuff, of course, it's important. Yes, the well-being stuff is important, but this co-curricular stuff is just all tied in with that um, as well. Has that started to shape not just your approach to students and how they learn and their development, but also your self-development? You know, you, you, you went from being a classroom teacher to being a secondary school head teacher, which takes a lot of bottle, you know, to put yourself out there and to take that risk and to take that step. And now you've gone from that to, you know, what you've already described as the five campuses in a country um, that's very different to one you've ever lived in before a country that's probably very different to a lot of other countries in the world <clears throat> for various different reasons. You've obviously got some confidence, a hell of a lot of confidence somewhere from something or, or from experiences that you've got to really put yourself, you know, like you said, what the students are, are experiencing out of your comfort zone to have a go at these things. Where does that come from? How, how do you find that? And do you still have those moments where you're a bit like, oh, what am I doing here? <laughs> 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 I have those moments on a daily ba basis, Lewis, um, you know, where you go, how did I end up in this situation? Um, for sure. And, you know, there are many things that, you know, I failed at in life. I wasn't the best academic in the world. Um, you know, uh, I found secondary school was probably a survival. I love my primary school. There was 50 of us. Um, then I moved to a senior school of 1200 and the whole thing was a bit shocking, really. Um, and, you know, it was about surviving and getting through. And I, I did enjoy the sick form, I have to be honest. But, you know, it's, you know, there are things that I failed at in my life. Um, and it's hard, you know, I failed my driving test the first time round. Um, you know, I, I, I went on a, um, an adult version of the 10 tours and I didn't manage to complete it. You know, there have been moments in my studies where perhaps I would have loved to have achieved a higher grade and I haven't. And I suppose all of those things are, are, are learning curves and I've certainly never take it for granted. And it's interesting because in some ways, yes, I suppose maybe there is a level of confidence there, but I wake up every day and go to sleep every day worrying about have I done a good enough job? Um, am I going to be able to do the job that I've been entrusted with? Um, and, you know, I, I talked to you earlier about being five campuses. When I took on this job, it was, you know, a, a main campus with a small satellite campus and it kind of accidentally grew. And uh, we ended up in the middle of a global pandemic, um, taking on a new campus and having to renovate that from scratch. And, you know, I've had to learn a huge amount very quickly, um, you know, in terms of multi-campus management, um, reno major renovation projects, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know is the answer, Lewis. I don't know where that conf uh, confidence comes from. I think some of it probably comes from those roots and that strong grounding I had back in Cornwall um, and that roots and wings. Um, I think some of it probably comes from the times where I failed and then having to kind of bounce back from that. Um, and some of it comes from having the right people around me who've been able to support me and you know there are times when I just pick up the phone and I say right I need some help with this can you walk me through this um i thinking that this is the way I should approach something what do you think and you know going out to some trusted people uh to to help me explore and find the answers and yeah it's I suppose it's quite multifaceted really so one of those points there is about waking up worried and going to sleep worried and, and reaching out to people to try and support you what what other anchors do you have that you know just quell those worries a little bit we all have those feelings don't we where we wake up anxious about the day ahead and some of the events we go to sleep wondering whether we've done the right thing whether we've upset people whether the repercussions of a decision might be something that that wasn't the right thing or, or how you interpreted the the decision to be or the situation to be how, how do you make peace with yourself how do you calm that mind and, and what kind of anchors do you have to help yourself out 
I suppose a few things. I mean, the thing that I always go back to is, can I look myself in the mirror and say that I've done the best by the children in my care? And even though a decision may be difficult to take, because and particularly at the moment where you know parents are homeschooling children they're frustrated they want their children back in school teachers want the children back in school they didn't go into teaching to do remote learning you're having to make these really difficult decisions have I done the very best by the kids each day given the problems and the constraints that we have and I think if I can make peace with that um, then I know it's right and if it isn't I need to go back and revisit a decision and I'm not afraid to do that you know there are times when you have to just go do you know hands up that didn't work we need to revisit that and do something in a, in a different way and I think it's being being prepared uh, to do that but it's also again going back to those having those moments where you do something mindfully I've got a jigsaw actually I'm just about to do for half term and I know it might sound terribly dull and boring but it's something where you just put your concentration in and just can step out of those you know that worry for a short period of time and it is finding those things I don't feel too bad about jigsaws. I remember Alan doing a, how, how many was that? 3,000 pieces jigsaw of the world back in the day? Yeah, no, that, that we was... Weren't, we weren't allowed to play pool on your pool table because there was a jigsaw <laughs> on it for three months. <laughs> it's good. I, I think the, the Lego's took, taken over now, Lewis. So I know Helen's a big Lego fan as well. Absolutely. Although I've decided the jigsaws are probably slightly cheaper and I'm running out of storage space <laughs> for my Lego. <laughs> yeah. oh. and, uh, on the podcast, we, we, we often talk about growth taking place outside your comfort zone. Now, you've moved, obviously, to a country where it's only last year women were allowed to drive and you're in this leadership position in, 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 a, in, a, in an organisation that's, that's there as a, as a school really driving the standards forward and you've got five campuses and you've got a huge amount of staff under your care, just tell us about the biggest challenge that you've faced and how important it was to, to get outside your comfort zone to, in, to have personal growth. Well, to be honest, I think I lost track of my comfort zone about uh, two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone finds it, please send it back. Um, but <laughs> yeah, there's definitely been a lot of personal growth in there. Um, but I think I'm always a great believer that you'll never be given more than you can cope with and that you will have the tools and resources to be able to deal with that and if you can't do it yourself you know there are people out there that can support you with that and I think one of the things that you know you just described you know sort of being in Saudi Arabia it's a country massively on the change and one thing I've discovered and I think on all my travels is that nothing's ever as you think it's going to be and the one thing that I found here is that I've been enormously welcomed and you know on so many occasions, I'm the only woman in the room. Um, yesterday, I was taking guests from the Ministry of Education around thinking, what on earth do they think about this? You know, because this is a country that's rapidly changing. Yet we had, it was just a really wonderful, welcoming um, uh, meeting. And all of the things that we've done over the last few years I've, uh, here, I've never at any point felt that there's been a gender issue for me. And so that's quite exciting because that's not what people will tell you um, about Saudi Arabia. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting process of change. And I know the minister said to me yesterday, um, you're an ambassador for our country um, and you know we want your school to feel welcome you're supporting us with our our vision for our country um, and yeah and we know that you're going to be that uh, ambassador for us and I, I thought that was that was quite an interesting um, comment and uh, viewpoint from them as well. Do, do you feel at any point an imposter Helen and, and how do oh, you deal with all the feelings? time all how do you the deal time. with it? I think to start with, particularly when you sort of start in a new job first time, you know, the imposter syndrome is sort of there on a daily basis. But I think particularly over the last 18 months where it has been, you know, quite a difficult time the last year with the, with the pandemic. And the thing I've realised is, 
Helen, get up, get out of bed because people need you to lead. And there are occasions where people just, you know, there are times when you need to take people on a journey and nurture and grow people. But there are times when things are difficult, where they need you to be that person for them. And I feel that responsibility. And I suppose that's the thing that kind of gets me going. Like they don't have time for your dramas about imposter syndrome and all of the rest of it. You've got to get on because you've got a job to do here and you need to go in and support these people and help make that difference. So it's a case of getting up, cracking on and seeing what the day brings. Is that right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, if, if you don't, sort of not quite bounce out of bed but you know get up and enjoy going into work and the things that you're doing and the people that you work with every day then you've got to say are you doing the right thing and you know I do love that I, I've worked with some amazing people some really talented uh, colleagues here and you know it's a pleasure to go in um, and know that we're working together and yes there are challenges in the day but you know you always go back to but we're here, you know, you, you sometimes have to sit back and go, what are we doing? You can get sort of mired down in the detail of, you know, someone's written in to complain or someone's not happy about something. Or you've got a difficult issue to deal with and just taking a step back from that and remembering what you're doing and why you're doing it um, and putting everything in perspective. Great. Just a, cu a couple of things here on, on, on leadership in terms of, core values and non-negotiable behaviours. Obviously, we've we've both worked with you quite a, a long time now and we know what those are. But could you just give our viewers just an indication of what your real core values are and the behaviours that, that are non-negotiable that, that in your establishment? You can probably tell me better than I can tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Um, yeah, no, it's a... And an interesting one, for me, children get one crack at their education. And for me, the non-negotiable is that we need to be the best that we can be for those children and providing. It's not just about providing top quality lessons. That's one element. It's about making sure that those children fit and feel that they belong and they're happy to be in your class and that you're providing that our teachers are prepared to go the extra mile. Um, you know, we, I always say to teachers at interview, we, we work hard during term time. You know, we're not a nine to five school, but you'll get good holidays. But during that term time, we really all need to work together and commit. And what is it that you're doing outside of the classroom to help develop the children? Is it through house? Is it through music? Is it through sport? But let's be you know, all be doing something that is, you know, contributing to the the, the broader work that we do. And I suppose those, those for me are just non-negotiable. And if, if people don't buy into that, then, you know, maybe we're the wrong school for them. In, in that situation, Helen, that's a, a really key element of leadership is what happens when you do have those people that aren't quite up to your standard and, and are not in quite with the mission and vision of the school. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's difficult. And I think it's about engaging people in the conversation um, and that they're understanding what your expectations are and where they're at. And ultimately, most people realize actually maybe this isn't a good fit and match for me and you'd like to think that people would make those decisions for themselves that you know there's another school out there that might just be a perfect fit for them but we're not that place um, and you want people to understand that uh, you know you don't want to be the school that is you know gets a reputation for um, you know just moving people moving people on you want people to grow and develop and it be through that process of their own self-reflection they work out where they need to be um, and we also it's about compassion isn't it um, you know teachers 
all have different needs at different times and I think it's about being supportive and there will be some times that people can do a bit more and come to the fore and then there'll be times where you know they need a little bit more support from us as well um, and we're a family and a community and so you know whilst I say we want people to go the extra mile you know if we support and help each other on that journey then there will be times when um, people can give more and are times when people perhaps can't quite give as much yeah th thank you helen thanks for answering that I, th I think we'll move forward now with winding it down to our quick fire questions at the end helen so i'll start with my particular favorite then three leaders in world history dead or alive who would you take out for a meal with you yeah i've uh... I've heard you ask this question a few times and I've been really mulling it over. It's hard because I think what I'd like to do is to go out for multiple meals and mix it up <laughs> a bit. Um, but I, I, I know I can't do that. Um, and I suppose it keeps for me coming down to the people that ordinary people that have done extraordinary things. And I think people that I've, I've thought about, I'd love to take Ernest Shackleton out. I think he's a phenomenal individual who didn't really ever achieve many of his um, objectives and expedition aims, um, yet um, has been billed as a phenomenal leader in the way that he led people through challenge and adversity and when things went wrong and you know an amazing individual he sort of ran off a few times um, to go off on expeditions sort of leaving his family penniless and you know a fascinating individual and I'd love to kind of get inside his head and work out what makes him tick and I find I read a lot of books about explorers and you know people that do extraordinary things you know what makes someone row across the Atlantic Ocean on their own for you you know, uh, tens of hundreds of days, you know, what, what, what is going through your head? Um, but these are ordinary people that do extraordinary things. Um, I think I'd add to that list someone like Marie Curie, you know, wow, a lady ahead of her time, you know, in terms of what she was doing in a very male-dominated um, field um, and, you know, has had such an impact uh, on the field of, of science. And then just to throw in sort of a bit of a curveball, I, I thought Rosa Parks might be a really interesting person. You know, what made her that day not get off that seat on that bus um, and, um, you know, the repercussions of that, um, you know, what at that moment decision, why did she decide to do that? Because, you know, the, the change that that sort of um, initiated and the conversations, wow. Um, and so, yeah, so those are the sorts of things that um, people that I'd like to take out. But, you know, those kinds of people, but mix it up. Like I said, multiple dinners, please. <laughs> and you Thanks, Alan. You've told us uh, you read a lot. Tell us what you're reading at the moment, Helen, or the, the last good book that you had in your hands. Um, well, I'm, I've normally got a couple of things on the go. Um, something that I read over the sort of December break was Joe Bowler's Limitless Minds. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. It was about that idea that, you know, let's just not put limits on what people can do. And I think we've all got stories of people that perhaps didn't necessarily achieve success in the way that we might have anticipated or maybe the way that schools measure success, um, but have gone on to be hugely successful in their fields. And I think it's about, you know, I, I remember when Jay Comfrey came on and you were talking to him and he said, you know, school wasn't necessarily the thing for him. And if he'd spoken to his teachers, they wouldn't necessarily have predicted where he is and what he's doing now. Um, and how can we not pick that up and just allow those people, those children to flourish um, in our schools? And so, yeah, that, that's been quite, quite an interesting um, one for me. I mean, I love all the stuff by Doug Lamoff as well. Just, you know, what are the little things day in, day out that we can do to make learning really good for children? And again, it's lots of ordinary things that make extraordinary differences um, in the lives of, of, of children and learners. It's a nice couple of those. Teaspoons of change, Lewis, isn't it, from Darcy? 
Yeah, Dan Dillon talked to us about teaspoons of change. And you, you've coupled up two really cool books there. The Joe Bowler seems to be following the sort of William Gardner rule of don't judge a child by um, how clever they are, but how they are clever. That kind of approach linked with, with real life tips on how to learn. That sounds like a dangerous combination for the mind in a good way. Absolutely. And I'm already now feeling terribly guilty that there are hundreds of books that I have read on learning in other areas that people are going, well, why didn't she mention that? But that just happens to be what I've read recently. I've got a really good recommendation for you, Helen, actually, and it links together the Explorer with the Limitless Minds. And that's, I don't even heard of him, a guy called Nims Perger, who is a, is a British Army Gurkha, Nepalese, who has just recently climbed 14 of the highest mountains in the world in seven months. The previous wow. record was seven years. And his book, um, it's called Beyond Possible, is an incredible book of, of talking exactly what you've just said there, where no one said it was possible. They said he couldn't raise the money. Why are you leaving the British Army and your pension? And he just had this positive mindset and went for it. And, and it's, a, it's a great read. A really right, good I've just written thing. that down. <laughs> Brilliant. It's on my list for half term. Brilliant. Good one. And and the last one from us, Helen. I think if you our title is The Infinite Learners and we have Infinite Leaders Live as our podcast. What does infinite learning mean to you? I think my view on this has changed over time. I think when I was at school and probably when we were all at school, you know, you kind of, you get your qualifications and you go into the, your job. Now I just see learning as just something that happens day in, day out. And if I'm not growing on a sort of daily basis and not challenging myself and not reading, not listening to podcasts, not learning, then I'm not doing the best by, you know, the people that are in my care, the people that I work with. Um, and yeah, it's, it's about continuing on that journey. I think for me, if you ever think you've got to the destination, then you're in trouble. Um, and it's all about the journey. And I don't think I'll ever get to my destination, wherever that might be. Um, but I hope that I'm going to continue on a really exciting journey. Oh, thank you, Helen. Love the, love the fact that we're on that journey with you as well and, uh, and looking forward to, to continuing that over the next few years. Louise, to finish. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, brilliant, Helen. Loads of takeaways there that are really interesting to sort of reflect upon. Um, and where, where can listeners uh, and, and viewers read more about the, the work you're doing and about the school? Can you give us a, a website or somewhere they can follow? Yeah, let's go to the school website. We've, we've ju actually just recently redone it. There's quite a lot of informa information there. So it's at bisr.com.sa. Um, and yeah, please, please engage with us through, through that. Um, and if you're interested, drop me an email. Um, we're always interested in people that want to come on the kind of journey that we're on and joining us here uh, in the in the desert. And it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, Lewis, I love working with you in the Philippines. Alan, it's great that you're here with us on our journey in Saudi Arabia. And it's an exciting one. Thank you, Helen. Been a pleasure to speak to you guys. Please search Infinite Leaders Live on YouTube and IGTV and find us at theinfinitelearners.com. Until next time, we'll say bye-bye. Please click, click subscribe and review uh, just so we can continue the work that we're doing and get our uh, guests' opinions and thoughts and fantastic advice out to more people worldwide. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Thanks, Helen.